Welcome to C3 TV, interviewing leaders. And today it's my absolute privilege to have a C3 movement legend, legend. Pastor Simon McIntyre. Currently located in London in the UK, Simon is a theologian, uh, he's a pastor, he's been a pilot, he's a grandfather, and he is a magnificent man who loves people with all his heart. So Simon, welcome to interviewing leaders. Oh, I'm not sure who you were talking about there, John. Thank you. It's wonderful to yeah, have you here. It. And uh, I want to today just chat with you and, and, and hear from you around the whole topic of being a follower and a great team player. Phil Pringle describes you as the A team player. And uh, you really began the very early days. You moved from New Zealand the same time as Pastor Phil and Chris with your wife, Helen, to be the part of the inaugural team of Christian City Church back in the day, and you've been part of the key team ever since then. Tell us a little bit about those early days. Do you know, John, um, just this, help, this could help people because when we came with Phil and Chris, we had no um, preconceptions or illusions. Right. I never considered myself, nor did Helen consider herself, uh, Phil and Chris's right-hand people. Mm -hmm. We just, um, we knew them as, they were our pastor, they were our youth leaders. Wow. In fact, I often say he's never stopped being my youth leader because <laughs> he won't grow up and neither will I. <laughs> Love it. And so when we came with them from Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, it was just to basically do whatever needed to be done. Wow. So there was no sense of we're coming as Phil and Chris Pringle's assistants. When that never entered the, 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 the picture. And in fact, in our written initial conversations about coming over, yes. Phil wanted to make it clear that we were coming on our own steam um, that we wouldn't be, um, you know, financially provided for, uh, especially in the early days. And none of that was even the beginning of a surprise because we never asked for it. Wow. So we asked for nothing and we expected no titles and we just come to serve. Brilliant. That's all we did. Tell me, did you have any idea at those early days of what God would do over the next 40 years? No idea. And I often say that if I'd known, I would never have started. And having done it, I never would have missed it. So, no, we had no idea, John. Right. No whatsoever. Phil had this idea that 500 people would be a mega church. Wow. And I would have thought that was remarkable. So no, under, no idea whatsoever, no conception. Tell us a little bit about those first five years here in Sydney. Well, do you know, they were tough. Um, we had to get jobs. Uh, we expected everything to explode overnight. Uh, Phil took over a small group of people at their request, um, at which point three of their leaders left. And that was amicable. It wasn't, they felt it was best that they did go. So we ended up with a small bunch of people uh, in the DY Surf Life Saving Club on a Sunday night. What was particularly funny is that the people who were the, um, I think they were residential caretakers, they, they got sick of us because we were so loud and we were annoying their Sunday night movie watching. So then we moved to a hall called St. Kevin's, which was quite remarkable because of the Catholic community and they allowed us to use their, their school hall. Right. And that's when it all just literally exploded. And to tell you the truth, um, I wasn't a very good assistant. I was um, scrappy, um, sometimes dismissive of people. Not, and it wasn't always very pleasant. I, I had a lot of growing up to do. Wow. Uh, I was raised in a good family, but an insular family and a slightly cynical family. And I think that all came to the fore. So Phil and I had some moments and um, I appreciate his candid, candid um, dealing with me, but it was good, it was good. Tell us about, give, give us an example of one of those moments. I, I think one of them that I remember the most was um, I made some contra, contrary comment in public in a public setting. It wasn't like at a, in a pulpit setting. Right. But I made a contrary comment to something that he wanted or asked for. And I was the sort of can't do guy and he's always been the can do guy. Mm -hmm. Now I've changed a lot and so has he. Mm -hmm. But in those days, so I remember one day we were sitting in a car and I think I said something cynical or a tad s s um, snipey. And Phil said to me, if you ever do that again, you won't be staying in this church. Wow. So it's quite strong. Yes. And I think he was also probably struggling with his sense of leadership. Um, the pressure of Sydney was not inconsiderable. He would suffer headaches a lot. And so I think that although we look back and say, wasn't it wonderful, it, it was tough. Yes. Our living circumstance was difficult. Uh, Phil and Chris and their family lived on our floor for about a month at one stage. 
so it wasn't all um, roses, or if it was, it was thorns all the way up to the petals. <laughs> Wow. So uh, that was one instance. That happened a few times yes. in latter years where he would uh, speak to me in no uncertain terms mm -hmm. and largely I deserved it. Mm -hmm. Okay. T tell me then out of that, I, I will come back later to your relationship and your friendship and how that can work in a ministry setting. But give, give us some idea of the different roles over the years that you've had within this church and within the movement. Um, floor sweeper. Yes. Um, you would have been good at that. Oh, brilliant. Genius. Oh, brilliant. In fact, I believe that I need to go back to that. <laughs> That's where my true calling was. Floor sweeper, setter outer of chairs, um, counting the offering, um, uh, uh, helping administrate the buying of tables. So one of my first staff positions was simply administrative. Right. Uh, I, I wasn't a pastor. Right. I wasn't even vaguely a pastor. I don't think I liked people that much. Wow. And I think I had a... A, a revelational moment where I learnt to love people. Wow. But it wasn't to me. I think it was natural to me from a kid. Yes. But I lost it in the years of cynicism. Wow. But it came back in like a revelational moment. T tell us about that moment. We, Phil asked me to see somebody. Uh, and at that moment, I felt a great love for that person. And, and I never went back on that sense for people. Wow. It just happened like that. So it's not smart of me. It just happened. Amazing. Um, then I did the Bible college. Then I pastored the pastors. Mm -hmm. And then I got shifted to this and that eventually ended up helping with the uh, with C3 Australia. Yes. I was the, uh, what would you call it? The, I'm not sure. The administrator. The administrator yes. of C3 Australia. Yes. I used to run the conferences. I used to drum at conferences and speak at conferences. You're a drummer. I was a drummer as well. Come on, almost a musician. Almost a musician, yes. That's almost. The drummers are the guys that hang around with musicians. <laughs> uh, I used to play along such alongside such luminaries as um, David Holmes. Yes. Uh, Andrew Naylor. Yes. Jeff Crabtree. And I think they tolerated me because <laughs> I ran the conference. Funny. That's funny. Uh, and I was also a smart aleck drummer. So, so what was pretty much happening simultaneously then is the church was growing. Yes. But then other churches were being planted and joining. So yes. there's like the, the, the birthing of a of church yes. and then the birthing of a movement. And yep. you were doing roles in both. Yeah, always have been. From the outset. I, I, look, in the beginning, it was more like just a connect of role with people. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it ended up I was probably always split between Oxford Falls mm -hmm. and, and Australia mm -hmm. and then the movement. Yes. Wow. Okay, so... Help people then who uh, need to kind of get that idea of, well, this is my gift or this is my thing. I should only do that. You obviously, or this is my vision in my ministry. Talk to me about your, what, what's Simon McIntyre's vision or ministry? Well, in the early days, John, I just did what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not, that's not being particularly humble. It was a fact. Mm -hmm. So I would say literally my ministry is to do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And because I have a reasonable skill range, mm -hmm. naturally, yep. I could probably do it. Yes. Is some people you wouldn't put them sure. in administration. Sure. So I can deal with administration, people, yes. um, speaking, teaching. Yes. So it's, I do have the capacity of across the board a bit. Mm -hmm. But you know what? You don't know that, do you? Right. Until you have to do it. Exactly. So I think that I just did what needed to be done. Yes. And I remember Phil literally said to me one day, he said, well, I'd like you to consider... Um, becoming the new Bible, the Bible college principal because the current principal is going to go and plant a church. Right. I said, how long do I have to think about that? He said, about 10 seconds. <laughs> so I, I just did it right. and enjoyed it. Yes. But then years later went on and did a Bachelor of Theology and, and now I'm also doing further studies. So it, it, it just happened. It needed right. to be done right. and I did it. So th what, what's then in a moment like that, because you're a great team player and you get asked to do something that, that half the time you're probably like, well, I don't really love that or I don't know if I'm going to be good at that or actually I really like what I'm doing right now. How have you processed that? What's been your, you, have you made a predetermined decision? How's, how have you done that? Uh, look, it's not predetermined. It is, it's a spontaneous reaction that mm -hmm. says that's what needs to be done. I'm happy to do it mm -hmm. and I'll learn it. Mm. I have always felt a little bit sad about what I stopped doing. Yes. That lasts for about 10 minutes. Right. Then I'm glad to be doing what I'm now doing. That's amazing. So I haven't really fought that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There may have been some things I was asked to do that, that probably weren't great for me. Yep. But we still, I still did them. Yes. 
Yeah. There are probably some things that I could have done that I wasn't asked. Mm -hmm. But I have never walked around saying um, I have a vision. Right. I I actually question the amount vision is mentioned in the New Testament. Right. I think you've got I think you've got once in a generation leaders mm -hmm. that have got more vision than they can deal with. Right. We don't need more vision. We don't the need church. more. So right. what they do is they offload their vision mm -hmm. that they cannot do by themselves mm -hmm. and then that becomes the property of the people working with them. Right. So I've always just worked with Phil um, in the vision of C3. Right. So would you say then your vision has, has, has essentially been to out of that connection to serve the vision that God's given to them? I, absolutely. Phil and Chris. Yeah, I don't have anything else to say to it. Wow, wow. I've never sought my own vision. Mm. And if I've ever thought perhaps I need a vision, it's always gone pear-shaped in my mind. Right. It doesn't work for me. Isn't that amazing? What, what, tell me then your feeling then for most people in churches, most leaders on teams, how do they need to think? Is that a good way to think? Well, I would think it was because it worked for me and it tends to work in our movement. Mm -hmm. And I, it tends to work across movements in the world. Right. Um, I think we just, people need, like myself, need to say, my vision is to do what needs to be done, is to serve the vision of the leader. And as long as that vision includes biblical integrity, right. it includes moral integrity, right. it includes the fiscal integrity, all those, as long as it includes those, yes. I have no argument. Right. It's just that's what we do. But I've discovered this, John, that doing that takes you on a journey that you couldn't have gone by yourself. Right. So the idea that I'd be living in London, not far off the centre of London, we're only a few miles from Buckingham Palace, not that the Queen knows. No, no. Although I pay taxes that help maintain her living standard. Um, so that, this, that, and then, you know, with Valerie, that's a, another long story mm. that has both sadness and joy in it. But being there with her and then overseeing Europe. Right. And just incidentally, you know, getting on a train and going to Paris to see someone for, for lunch. I mean, I never imagined any of this. Right. Oh, I'm not that smart. You just go with what's in front of you. Wow. Knock on the doors or have other people knock on the doors or open the doors for you. Wow. Walk through. Wow. It's an adventure. Fantastic. I said to Valerie the other day, what an adventure. Brilliant. I mean, so right now, C3 around the globe is around 550 churches. It is. Started from one church. One church. Over, almost 40 years ago. It's a phenomenon of what God's done. It is, but because you're in it, mm. you don't quite see it. Right. I think, isn't this what everybody um, faces? What we do is we see people who've got more and say, what's wrong with us? Mm -hmm. Which is absurd. Mm -hmm. Wow. Talk, talk to me, Simon. Um, you have a great friendship with Pastor Phil and Chris. You have for many years before the church began. How does, how does someone on a team and how does a pastor negotiate the area of friendship and ministry and servanthood? How do those things work together? Jenna John, this is an interesting story because we saw people who wanted to model themselves off Phil and I and mm -hmm. it didn't work. Right. Because um, we have this uh, unusual family connection yes. that's a little bit larger than just a working relationship. Mm -hmm. So when we came here, we were each other's families. Right. So Christine and Helen uh, were each other's best buddies. Yes. And so they they would pray for the children. Yes. They would, um, you know, aside from a whole lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And Helen never had any ambition except to do what was in front of her. And she mm -hmm. loved her children. Mm -hmm. And uh, she did that magnificently. And she loved Phil and Chris. Mm -hmm. And she did that magnificently. Mm -hmm. And she loved the friends around us. Mm -hmm. And she did that magnificently. Mm -hmm. So we just, we... Uh, I calculated one day, we did 30 Christmases in a row with wow. Phil and Chris. Wow. Now that's, that's a family. Yes. So I think that's part of the success. Yes. You can't manufacture that. Yes. The other side of it is that I used to figure out, and I learned the hard way, that he was my boss on Sunday yes. and my friend on Monday. Right. Monday being your day off. Yeah. So, through, so in, in that sense, give some advice to people who are either... Let's start with senior pastors because it can be a lonely role to be a senior yep. pastor and there can be a, a, a need and a, almost a, well, it's an inbuilt need for friendship. Yep. How do you do that within your church or are you better to build it beyond your church? Uh, I would say on the, um, on the balance of things, it's better beyond. Mm -hmm. um, the Phil and Simon story is not normal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. And I think if you asked Phil, he would probably say the same. Mm -hmm. And to this day, we 
wouldn't matter how we felt about each other, we would be working together as family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would matter ultimately, wouldn't yes. it? Yes. But if there were moments, which there have been, it's of no ultimate consequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think you, need, you do need friends. You do need to reconcile that leadership's lonely. Yes. You don't reconcile that, you'll never make it. Right. But you do need friends outside. Mm -hmm. It is occasional you'll find friends inside your church that aren't connected to ministry. Right. They may be a business person. Yes. They may be a university lecturer. Right. They may be a policeman. Yes. But they're not necessarily connected to the ministry yes. style of your church. Yes. So yes. Their, friendship, their friendship doesn't have to have the awkwardness of, I could sack you. Right. Yes. And I think that's where the awkwardness comes. That's a unique challenge, isn't yeah. it? I mean... Yeah, and I, I do think that sometimes you can have those friendships mm -hmm. inside, mm -hmm. but there's always going to be a difference. There still is a difference between Phil and I, mm. but our friendship's more like holiday, family. Mm -hmm. So if we're if we're on holiday together, which we still holiday together, yes, which is cr you know wild after all these years, wonderful and wonderful, but but it, you know he's not my boss on a you know on our holiday, right, right. Uh, he's my friend, yes. Uh, I may defer to him at moments yes. because you tend to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but he, it's not like we're sitting there with some hierarchy of leadership. Mm -hmm. We're just friends. Mm -hmm. yes. And we talk about what maybe deeply matters to us. Yes. Or we don't, him, Phil and I don't have to talk. Right. It's got the depth of friendship. We've got a friendship. So if we went for a day, uh, we were on holiday together and we never said much for the day, nothing's wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's great. I don't have to talk. It's great. He doesn't have to talk. Okay, so and you said that people have tried to model off that and it hasn't worked, and I, I, I've seen that. Um, so therefore, as a team player, what what should be my first priority towards my my leader, my my senior pastor? Um, I would think uh, basically respect and honour. Mm -hmm. I think that's as simple as it is. Mm -hmm. um, if you have if you're there for a purpose and a reason, like we heard Pat Ancliffe yesterday, yes. say that he felt when he came to this church, he felt a distinct call to Phil and Chris. I'd say Mark and Bernadette Kelsey would say exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So that tempers everything. Mm -hmm. And so they can walk through anything because of that. Yes. But I think respect. respect. And I think that's a simple um, human maturity and it's a biblical necessity. Very good. Okay, so what about when your leader makes a decision that you don't think is the best one, that's, there's no immorality, no lack of integrity, you just don't think it's the best decision. How do you process that? Um, if it's not, if it doesn't smell of something, mm -hmm. you just get behind it. Mm -hmm. yep. the, the thing you have to watch is if it doesn't work, yes. you don't rely, resort to the old, I told you so. Right. So I think that's useless. Right. You, you know, there's no point telling a person who's fallen over, they've fallen over. Mm -hmm. They're quite well aware of it. Mm -hmm. You need to pick them up. So I think that I've always, I don't agree with everything. Yes. I don't always like everything. Sure. But I don't, it, if it's not, you know, if it's not immoral, unethical or unbiblical, I, I don't have an issue with it. Right. But at the same time, you don't blindly, you don't not share your perspective or opinion. No, I've been called the contrary one at times. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a problem with saying, if I see something that could be troubling, I'll yes. say it. Right. Or if I have a feeling that needs to be expressed, yes. I'll express it. Right. Uh, and beyond that, th that's all you need to do. Yes. Now I don't, I don't go dumping. Sure. Or, 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 or becoming you know, boisterous and, mm -hmm. and um, obstreperous and, right. and worrisome to fill. Right. But, but I do have the capacity of saying it. But having said that, John, it's not much. No, no. It's not much. Like, even though we have, you know, like a voting, constitutional voting structure, mm -hmm. I don't remember the day we've ever actually had to vote. Mm -hmm. Once in all my years on a church board, I said, I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think it's wrong from my perspective and I want it recorded as wrong. Mm -hmm. I look back on that and go, that was a tad bolshie. Mm -hmm. I should have just said it. Right. And right. I didn't agree with it. Right. But... But I didn't, after that, undermine the decision. Right. I'm on board. Right. I'm as responsible. That's great. That is really and good. And I bear the load. Yep. That's a great if, team mentality. If it, if it lost people or money, mm -hmm. I'm on board. Right. You're not pointing the finger back no. going, I told you so. No. I think it, <laughs> but I don't say it. <laughs> I, don't, was, I don't live it out. It's great. That was our decision. Yeah. I, I want us to go to the moment so... A number of years ago, Simon, you made the move from Sydney to London. 
And there's quite some amazing God circumstances around that. Talk us through how that came to pass. Well, it was one of those things that you, you get this sort of confluence of situations, don't you? Or the, or the perfect good storm, mm -hmm. although it had some bad moments. So leading up to it, I had been helping Phil and Chris by being the location or campus pastor for Silverwater here right. in Sydney. Okay, so that's that's about half an hour away from where yep. the, the main church had been. Yep. That church had been taken on as a campus by We Oxford took Falls. on a very difficult circumstance. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would go out with Phil during the day yes. uh, when we'd meet the people. And yes. I, he just said to me one day, look, I'd like to put Mark and Bernadette as the, as the uh, executive pastors at Oxford Falls. Yes. Are you okay with that? And I said, absolutely. Yes. It's not a job I, I need to do. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was delighted for them yes. and thrilled for me. So he, he gave me the job um, to oversee uh, Camp Silverwater. Yes. I asked for a young couple to go with me yes. who are now the currently the, local, campus, the pastors. campus pastors yes. uh, and doing a wonderful job mm -hmm. by, all, by all accounts. Yes. I don't see a lot of them obviously these days. And then uh, we were aware of the stirrings of troubles in Europe. Mm -hmm. We had an overseer that at, at that stage hadn't gone all the way with his problems. Yes. But the, the, there was a quiet boil. Yes. And we were hearing little stories that weren't, yes. weren't great. Yes. But nothing so troubling you'd run over. Mm -hmm. So then through all this process, most people know that my first wife, Helen, died of cancer. Mm -hmm. And then we had a gap of about two years. Mm -hmm. And in that time, uh, remarkably, I met Valerie, mm. who just happened to be in C3 uh, Manhattan, mm -hmm. one of our churches in New York, mm -hmm. who just happened to be my children's friend. Because mm -hmm. my oldest um, child, Reuben and Deborah and their family Had were assisting there, there for, yes. for a year or two. Yes. So Valerie was, was their friend. She used to take out my granddaughters on dates in New York. Awesome. It was remarkable. That's crazy. So one day we were, uh, and that was bubbling away that relationship. Mm -hmm. It hadn't resolved itself, but it was certainly on a good trajectory. And, uh, and I was delighted. But during that time, we had a week of prayer and fasting mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. at Oxford Falls. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that week, we would pray each day for eight hours, for three days, the whole staff. Amazing. Wait on the Lord, pray have a little break, but I think we fasted and prayed. Amazing. At the end of that, I sat in Phil and Christine Pringle's office. I think it was Mark, mm -hmm. Phil, myself and Christine. Mm -hmm. By the end of that meeting, I had handed over silver water. They, nobody knew about this. Mm -hmm. I was going to marry Valerie. That, it's, it's a bit more complex than that. I get it, I This get is it. the big picture. It all just at all. And I was going to shift to, to England and I'd even figured out how I could do it financially. Wow. All within 10 minutes. Wow. Well, 20 minutes. That was one of those God things. Out of that prayer and fasting. Out of prayer and fasting, total redirection. Wow. So then we looked into how we got there. That took us a bit longer. Yes. Uh, now we're permanent residents of the so UK. Did, so in that meeting, did, did, did you raise, I think I need to go to London? Had it been talked about before? No, no. I mean, I had in the back of my mind, I'm probably better suited to Europe than other places. Right. I'm, I'd be but your beautiful dress sense, there's no doubt about that. Oh yes, it's just magnificent, mm. yes. I wear Paul Smith, mm -hmm. it's lovely. Exactly. Um, so in some ways it answered a desire way in the back of my brain that I'd never articulated. Interesting. No, that Phil said, what about going to London? Hmm. And I said, yep, got it. And best thing I did. Wow. And um, in fact, I feel in some ways cheeky talking about follow followership because I'm sort of, I, I'm not so much in that world anymore. Mm, mm. I have to have vision, mm -hmm. I have to lead mm -hmm. leaders, yes. I have to pastor pastors. Yes. But this is my- But you got to where you got to by being the ultimate team player for without 35 a clear years, vision for yourself. For 35 and then, years, boom. absolutely. Never expected it, mm -hmm. never looked for it. Mm -hmm. It just unfolded. Mm -hmm. Wow. And to me, that talks about our destiny being linked in other people. Utterly. When you're linked to the right people, you'll go way beyond where you can go on your oh, own. Look, I've done more. I've done more, made more, seen more, enjoyed more, and suffered more in some areas mm -hmm. than I could ever have imagined. Wow. wow. Ever. So, okay, let's just talk about Europe then for a moment, because this is great. Since you've been to Europe, there are now how many churches? Well, I arrived and there were 13. And I think we let a couple go around that time. Mm -hmm. And it was good that we did. Mm -hmm. We now have 35. Um, we um, will probably have, 
40 within the next 18 months. And it's been a magnificent journey. Our conference just this last year, 2018, held in Lausanne, Switzerland. Could we go to a worse place? Not possible. Someone's got to do it. Oh, it's, it's an unbelievable place. Uh, we had 625 registered people. We had to close registrations. We were oversubscribed. And we had, honestly, a magnificent conference. 13 new church plants, locations, connections, uh, ordained. So it's been a wonderful journey. So what was a very challenging area for C3 has become a flourishing zone. Yeah, and I think it's partly because Valerie's a Northern Hemisphere girl. Mm -hmm. She's part of the magic, by the way. Yes, absolutely. She's part of the magic. I don't think I She's would have gorgeous. done it otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I will often say I, I couldn't have done it without her. Mm -hmm. She is slotted into ministry world unbelievably, and yet she still runs her own business in New York. Mm. So, yeah, we've seen great growth. We have, I think, uh, one of the most wonderful connections with pastors that I've experienced. We have a senior leadership team that spends three days every year away somewhere in Europe. And we don't sort of go to... You go to the, tough areas that yeah, someone's going to go to. go to, to Glasgow you? for those things. <laughs> um, all due respect to Glaswegians. We love Glasgow. We do. And we'll plant a church there one day. Brilliant. Brilliant. Simon, it's been great talking uh, on C3 TV's Interviewing Leaders. Uh, I want to say to those of you who are watching and enjoying this, love you to subscribe to our channel, to share it with friends, and look forward to seeing you again soon at C3 TV.